we're recording. Hi, welcome okay. everyone, and over to Halil. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. Today, I'm so lucky and triple privileged because we are together with three MEPs who have already mastered DP500 exam, and they are the top resources if you are planning to take this exam. My name is Salil, if I include myself as well, uh, we are four MEPs here. I don't know if there is any other MEP in the audience, it might be. Anyway, uh, I'm going to hand over to Rishi direct. You can introduce yourself and I think you're going to manage the session more than me and I will try to help you. Sure, if great. There some can questions in the chat window. Great, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. Any questions? Yeah, please find them in the chat window, and we'll pick them up as we go. We wanna, we want this to be a really interactive session, by the way. So if you're not comfortable with interaction, please also drop off and watch back the recording. <laughs> but uh, exactly. Yeah, you know, we're, we're gonna have we're Fair gonna enough. have some quiz questions, and we expect participation from people. Um, not you, Anthony. You've got too much participation. But just just messing. Um, right. So um, yeah, welcome to the welcome to the session. Um, and so this is the a guide to the Azure Enterprise Data Analyst Associate certification, which is the DP500. So just one exam you need to get certified as an enterprise data analyst. Um, it's a mixture of Azure and Power BI, as we'll look at. And um, yeah, we'll go through now the presenters. So Nicola, over to you first. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Rishi. Thanks, uh, Hal, for organizing and thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name is Nikolic. Uh, I'm originally from Belgrade in Serbia, but for the last uh, more than six years, I live in a wonderful city in, uh, of Salzburg in Austria, where I work as an independent data platform consultant and trainer. Uh, you can find more details about me on this slide, so I'm handing over to Andy. Hello there. Yes, so I'm based in the UK. Uh, I'm going to make it easy, about half an hour outside of London, and it's where I've always lived. Um, I think I would also like to live over in Austria. I think it's a lovely country. Um, I blog mostly at serverlesssql.com. So it's all about uh, Synapse Analytics, mostly serverless SQL pools. And I work uh, as an independent Azure data platform consultant as well with Synapse Analytics. So I'll hand over to Rishi. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Andy. So yeah, Rishi. So. I work at a company called Avenard. Um, it's actually a joint venture between Accenture and Microsoft. So it's 80% owned by Accenture, so it's about Microsoft. Um, and so we're the kind of world leader, if you like, in Microsoft consulting services. So everything from data, security, development. Um, there I focus mainly in Power BI and mainly in the kind of governance space. So looking at self-service BI and adoption of Power BI. Um, I run two main communities at the moment. One is called LearnDataInsights.com, um, LDI for short, um, and that's where we go and I provide quizzes for helping people prepare for Microsoft exams. So I've had a whole load for DA100, which is now PL300, and I've got two modules done for uh, DP500, and I'm putting a few up more, um, you know, over the coming weeks. Um, it's it's quite time consuming to write these questions, but it's a really good way to learn. So if anyone wants to help me write questions, please, please let me know. Um, the other the other community is Power Platform Finance. So I'm an accountant by background and I yeah run a community to help people specifically with kind of financial reporting um, and connecting to finance systems, working with general ledger or trial balance and, and all those sorts of things there. Um, so yeah, you can you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn, uh, Ask the Prono. I'm I'm there as well. So yeah, please please come and reach out to me. Um, right, so we've got this new certification. It's been launched um, a few couple of months ago. So it was in beta up until June, I think. Um, and it's it's quite an interesting exam because or an, an interesting area. So traditionally, there's been one kind of Power BI exam. There's been the DA100, which has covered everything in, in Power BI. Um, and Power BI has grown in its scope uh, massively in terms of the features. And there's lots of things that have, have been really aimed at the more enterprise level Power BI. So things with integration with Azure, things like external tools um, to do, you know, data model, manage enterprise data models with Power BI Premium and all of these sorts of things. And suddenly then I think the Power BI exam became quite too broad, I think, to be able to cater for both those 
analysts who, who really focus on the reporting and the enterprise data analysts, stroke data engineers who have to do work with, you know, billions of rows of data and, and very, very large data models and things like that. So what Microsoft have done, um, and it's someone called Shannon Lindsay who's come in and, and curated this, if, if you know her in the community, is split the exams into two, essentially. So some of the more technical bits of DA100 have been taken out. So now PL300 is the Power BI core Power BI data analyst exam, and that's focused primarily at kind of report builders. Um, so it doesn't go hugely into kind of DAX data modeling and, and, and really advanced or, you know, things like query folding and things like that. It will touch on Power Query or touch on DAX. It will look at data model design and, and also, um, yeah, thanks, Andy, and also visualization. But then we've got DP500, which is really aimed at those people who work with enterprise data. So large data models, actually, it uses who use Azure as a, as a back end. Um, and you'll see, you know, more and more integration between Power BI and Azure, especially Synapse, because the Synapse team and the Power BI team within Microsoft are now a single team. And, and that's quite telling about the direction that Microsoft are really going in this. So my first kind of tip on this is if you're if you if, if you're seriously in this space, it's definitely worth considering because Microsoft are really moving in that direction of, of integrating Synapse and Power BI. So this exam covers that re integration really, really well. Um, you will have to learn some new things if you're used to Power BI, um, but it's it'll be worth it because it's the direction that Microsoft are going in. So um, who is it really aimed at? Well, as you say, it's it's really aimed at those people who've been working with Power BI for you know at least a year or two, I would say, um, who you know have some good Power Query and DAX skills, um, and also people who are used to actually working with not just consuming pre-built data sets or consuming even pre-built data, but actually getting involved right at the beginning to understand what ETL do we need to get our data in the right shape? What, um, you know, extract, transform, load? You know, how do we need to shape our data? What kind of transformations do we need to do? How can we do that at scale in the most performant and the most efficient way? Once we've got a data model, especially a large data model that we're potentially hosting in Power BI Premium, how do we manage that data model? How do we use external tools? How do we use you know, update the metadata. So if we want to make a, a small change to the model, we don't have to, and it's a 10 gig model, we don't want to have to refresh the entire model. How can we make changes to just the metadata, for example, of a model? Things like that um, and, and those kind of challenges. Also things like governance, which is a huge area in Power BI. As I said, it's something that I focus on almost exclusively these days. But it's, you know, how do I do things like tenant settings and consider licensing? So it's not something that if you're a day-to-day -day report analyst, you might need to worry about. But if you're working at an enterprise scale with Power BI, absolutely it is. So definitely focus on performance, definitely focus on data models, um, and also some of the ETL, some of the Azure, some of the back end. Um, so you know, some of these things are cleaning and transforming data. Some of that will be in Azure, and some of that will be in Power, in Power BI. So using data flows or data marts. Data marts aren't in there yet because it's in preview, but when they come in GA, this was this is where they will be almost almost certainly. Um, and some of that will be in, yeah, in Power BI and data flow. So things like query folding, things like, um, you know, advanced error handling and things like that in Power Query will be in this syllabus. Um, and deployment pipelines, things like that will be here as well. So one thing to, to talk about here is it's a very, very broad syllabus. Um, and I think I put this on LinkedIn recently, you know, when I looked at this syllabus, I looked at it and I did the kind of standard, okay, how much of this do I feel confident about? And it was about 50%. And I've been working with Power BI every day for the last seven years. So I'm thinking, hang on a second, if Microsoft, where, 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 I, I felt a bit lost at this point, right? Like really questioning my career choices. Um, because it covers a lot of things. It covers things like purview, which I have no experience in. And actually, even now, I don't really have real hands-on experience working with purview. I, I know a bit about it from, um, from, from reading some stuff. Um, and, you know, querying, transforming data. Yep, the analytics stuff, the Synapse stuff, not so much. Um, implementing managed data models. So, yeah, I knew most of this. So a lot of it was kind of, you know, Tableau Editor and DAX data modeling and, you know, XMLA endpoints, things like that. So familiar with most of that stuff. But again, there was still a few things in there. I was like, oh, actually, I probably need to need to brush up on that. Exploring and visualizing data was things like um, paginated reports, accessibility, um, 
Oh God, what else is there? Um, a, a few different things. Actually, some Python, Python stuff in there as well. We were just talking about Python before, before on this call about you know Microsoft decided to chuck a bit of Python in there, both in terms of the visualization, so R and Python visuals, but also in terms of PySpark, so on the data engineering side. Again, not something that I've really done much as a Power BI developer. Really touch Python, so you know you can see why I was kind of a little bit a bit hesitant to, to take this exam and thinking, okay, well, if I only know about half of this, I'm not sure I'm going to pass it. But I got a code to do it for free in beta, as did as did the people here on the call who've taken it. And you know, even though it's a broad syllabus, I think it's it's okay. So just to to recap, kind of what some of the things that it covers. So data lake. Gen 2, Azure Data Lake, Synapse, those two obviously very connected. Um, DevOps, so some things around um, how do you do version control? Um, uh, is this actually one of the things in there, both in terms of on the Azure side and also in terms of on the Power BI side? And, and potentially there's there's a bit of both going on there. Um, and Azure Purview, so I mentioned. And then on the Power BI side, we've got things like external tools. Um, and just to give a bit of context for where someone who has this certification or does this exam will sit in a, an organization typically it's you know the power bi data analysts these are your people who um have do, do the pl300 so i mean typically one of the things i kind of look at as well when you look at an organization and the roles is these kind of belts um so at the bottom you've got your blue belts and these are your end users all they do is go in and consume reports and if you think about it, it's like a pyramid they're the bottom of the pyramid and they're by far the largest user group in any organization um and they're really important <laughs> because you need to you still need to train those people and you need to get them on, on board you've then got um green belts and these are your kind of people who will build potentially reports of pre-built data sets, but not necessarily build their own data sets. They don't really know M and DAX that well. Um, you know, they're, they're more just focused on the visualization on the business analysis side. Um, you've then got red belts. So this is your kind of core developer community. So these are all the people who build stuff in Power BI and have learned some M, learned some DAX. Again, you know, they're on a journey. We're all on a journey, but they probably, you know, maybe somewhere at the, more at the beginning of the journey. They haven't necessarily mastered. They're not going to be able to work necessarily with the enterprise to build, you know, data models and reports that can be used by thousands of users simultaneously and be performance and, and with, with you know, millions of rows of data. So those are really your black belts. Those are the people who build enterprise BI. So those are the people who are going to really build the stuff that's, um, you know, your shared data set data models, um, your, you know, working with large data volumes, manage performance, manage your Power BI premium capacity. Those those people um, are very few and far between in the organization, but they're the people that, who can support the red belts and each level can support the levels below them. So that's really your your standard operating model for an organization. And you can see that kind of reflected here as well. Um, and obviously you've got the interactions with, with other people within the organization. Just in terms of some of the topics it's covering, so say Purview, Power BI, Synapse, external tools, um, talked about talked about some of those. Um, I just wanted to close off a little bit about just giving some tips for the exam. And I'm gonna come back to these at the end and, and, and just recap on these to, to put them into context. But the first thing I'd say is that you don't need to be an expert on all of those topics. There's 49 skills measured. If you're waiting to be an expert in all of those 49 skills, you will, Microsoft will guaranteed move faster than you can learn this stuff. <laughs> you're not going to be able to keep up. So don't try. Don't try and be an expert in everything. One thing I have kind of my own personal observation on this is that once I took the exam, it was quite obvious that it was written by Power BI experts. Um, you know, by by some of the Power BI MVPs. So the Power BI stuff, you know, you definitely need experience with. I think for some of the stuff like Synapse and Purview, as long as you've done some of the reading for it, I think you can, you, you'll be okay. Um, and the second thing is to use practice questions as a way of learning. Um, I'm not just saying that because I write practice questions on my site. Um, actually, it's a really good way of being able to identify and fill knowledge gaps across what is a very, very broad syllabus. You don't know what you don't know. Um, and that was definitely true for me. And I, I imagine it's true for a lot of people. When you're looking at a syllabus like that, you're like, actually, I don't know. Maybe maybe I know some stuff about this. I don't know if I know enough to be able to, to pass an exam on it. So quizzes um, and practice questions are a really good way of, of doing that. Um, but use them as a learning tool rather than just a testing tool. It's not really a testing tool. It's more for you to 
find out what you don't know much about and then you know find out follow links hopefully they provide links for you to learn more like i do in my quizzes and then um let, use those to, to learn the the other thing is there's a lot a lot of material in all of these topics um you know you, you google any one of these topics of those 49 skills measured and you'll come up with whole loads of material and again you can't consume it all so don't feel like you have to don't feel like you need to read 10 blogs on every single topic before you're ready to take the exam um find you know one or two people that communicate this co these concepts um andy and nicola are my two favorites <laughs> on these areas and you know find material that resonates with you and, and stick with that and kind of focus on those and you know look at le learn in a way that works best for you um cool okay so um now we're over to the to the core content um yep cool so are there any questions thanks for answering that one anthony yeah but I, I would suggest if you're new to power bi i would definitely suggest starting with pl300 uh, rather than dp500 really i think you want at least one or two years experience with power bi um, before you before you take the exam. Um, limits with using Python and R visuals in Power BI. I mean, you need for refresh, you need a personal gateway, uh, which is a huge limit. Um, and so, yeah, I, it's not something I've used massively in an enterprise environment. It's, it's something that'd be quite cool. That's quite cool to play with if you try and deploy that in an enterprise environment. Um, it, 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 there are challenges around it, which also might question why it's in an enterprise exam but i get it it is it is part of the same it is it, it is a useful skill to have for someone at this at this level okay um if there's no other questions have you seen in the chat are there any other questions that we wanted to answer at this point before we dive into the content i think we are good to go rishi okay brilliant and first, in which case firstly i'm just going to start with a very quick poll um so before we start, how are you feeling about the exam? Just as a word. So this is just going to come up as a word cloud, you know, put in a word or two words. I was nervous. <laughs> nervous? I mean, just how are you feeling about it now, right? Like, do you feel confident? Do you feel like, okay, good. Quietly confident. Good, good. Okay, nice. Not sure. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully, hopefully you'll become a little bit more sure through the response. So we'll do this. We'll do this again at the end, and let's see. Let's see if anyone, if any of these answers change. Maybe they don't. Maybe maybe this isn't enough. But, but this is good. Thank you. Thank you for that. We've got eleven responses. Um, can you guys see the results as well? Well, not yet. Do I need not to? Not yet. There you go. Can you see it We've now? We've got a lot of excited. Yeah, yeah. This a lot of excited. That's what we like to see. Good, good. All right, brilliant. So um, now over to, so Nicola and Andy are going to present the main content bits that at the end of each section. So we've divided this presentation into four because there's four modules in TP500. So for each of those, it's a mixture of Azure Synapse and Power BI. So Nicola is going to present the Power BI stuff, Andy, the Azure stuff. And then at the end of each topic, I've got two quiz questions for each topic that we'll answer in the same way we just did this word cloud. So just the same kind of poll, a multiple choice, all multiple choice. Um, and we'll just, there's no no pressure to get the right answers. We'll just, uh, we're gonna have fun with it. So the first one we've got is purview. So over to Andy. Hello, right, thanks Rishi. Yes, so we have some data governance in terms of purview. Now, one of the most important things to look at with purview in the DP500 is we're looking at the data map and the data catalog. So if you switch to the next slide. So if you bring up all of the items uh, on the slide, Rishi, there you go. So with the data catalog, what we're able to do is we're able to look at various assets, and they're called assets, that are registered in Purview for Power BI. OK, so we do actually have the data sources themselves. If they come from the data lake, if they come from a SQL database or Synapse, if they feed into a data flow, we can register those assets. We've got data sets, reports and dashboards. OK, so we've got those assets from Power BI being registered and being browsable in the data catalogue with the lineage as well okay so the catalog is for browsing the assets for searching the catalog and for seeing the lineage between those items so next slide please rishi 
OK, now with the data map, what we're doing is we are registering those data sources. Now we can register a Synapse Analytics workspace, a dedicated SQL pool, a serverless SQL pool, and of course, Power BI. OK, now we are grouping these data sources into collections. So, for example, I've got a collection here where I've got uh, a global collection where I've got some data sources relevant to you know, my company as a whole. And then I've got some collections uh, called regions where I've got some data sources registered in different regions. OK, now this is a topology and I can design this, you know, whatever meets my organization's need. But the takeaway here is the data map is where you register data sources. OK, where well, the data catalog is where you browse the assets. OK, so uh, next slide, Rishi, and I think it might be over to uh, Nicola. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, switching over to Power BI because we are still in administration and governance uh, skill measure topic. So here uh, I just put in two, uh, two uh, uh, let's say, parts, main characteristics of two uh, versions when you are uh, deciding which, uh, which licensing option to choose for the enterprise. So there are basically two groups of licenses. First is uh, related to a specific user, to individual user, and here you are paying basically for user's license. Uh, there are two options here. First one is to pay 10 US dollars uh, per month for pro license. And there is also the one that Microsoft introduced, I think last year or something like this, uh, premium per user. So basically you can do an upgrade on pro license paying 10 months, uh, $10 per month more, or you can take this one as a standalone uh, license. So this is per user. So you're paying for each user, we are paying this amount. Uh, the other group is per capacity. So in this case, you are paying per, for the whole capacity. So no matter how many users you have there, you are paying per capacity. Uh, price per capacity depends on the capacity features, number of CPUs, uh, and so on. So it starts somewhere around 5,000 uh, US dollars per month. And here, basically the key thing to keep in mind uh, regarding capacity licensing options that when you create content, not you, but uh, uh, your users, when they create content, you are assigning that, that content to a capacity. So content can be shared uh, from this capacity then. Uh, can you move it to the next one, Rishi, please? Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, here uh, I put a little, a, a small table, very basic table uh, with an emphasis, emphasis on who can see what when something is shared from the specific type of license? Uh, so uh, can you just you click twice more, twice more? Thanks, Rishi. So I want you to pay attention on these no options uh, because probably you will get some case study in the in in the exam uh, where you will be in charge of deciding uh, uh, which uh, license type to choose depending on the use case. And it's important to understand that, for example, if your users, report creators have premium per user license. Uh, this content can be consumed only by other users who also have premium per user license. Uh, so this table can be a good reference when you are planning which capacity, uh, which license type to choose for the enterprise. And uh, yeah, next one, Rishi, I think it's, yeah, basically some recommendations. Uh, uh, also very important for the exam uh, for case studies. So if you have a large number of, of consumers, uh, let's say uh, between more than 250 and uh, uh, starting from that number, so it makes sense then to pay for uh, premium capacity because uh, if you need, let's say, premium features and you decide to use premium per user license for 250 users, you will pay 5,000 and uh, that's exactly the same as the whole capacity where you are not limited uh, then with number of users that will consume the content. Also, uh, premium capacity makes sense for very large data models in uh, shared capacities. So with uh, pro licenses, uh, there is uh, a, a limit of one gigabyte per data set, uh, which is uh, uh, way more in premium capacity. So if you have very large data models, then premium is the option for you. Uh, for 
premium per user, which is attractive with its price of only $20 per month. Uh, it makes sense if you don't have a large number of users and you still need premium features such as deployment pipelines, paginated reports, and so on. So it makes sense then to, to uh, buy premium per user licenses. Uh, we can go to the next one, yeah, Rishi. Just, just yeah, to add okay. on that as well, you can't, you can't put all your kind of data flows and share data sets in a premium per user workspace and then build a report and publish that yeah. to a non-premium per user workspace and expect people to be able that's to use gonna it. That's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not, not going to work. work. So yeah. everyone who views any content that is based on PPU content, regardless of whether it's directly or indirectly, needs a license. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thank, 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 may, thanks, I add, yeah. may I add one thing to this solution? Uh, if you use premium per user license to create your data flows, and if you if you put your output into Azure Data Lake Data Lake Storage Gen two, then you can use your pro license. That's true. That's true. Yeah, there, there is a there is a workaround, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for the exam, don't apply this workaround. Yes, <laughs> you, <laughs> exactly. you, it will be incorrect. For, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, in, in real life, yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah, pipelines, uh, uh, it's another feature very important and uh, relatively new in Power BI. So basically what's important to keep in mind regarding the deployment pipelines is that permissions for deployment pipelines are managed separately than uh, for workspace permissions. And uh, you need to define who should have the access to the pipeline, uh, which operations should users with pipeline access be able to perform in each stage of the pipeline. So we are talking about three stages, development, test and production. Uh, then who is reviewing content uh, in the test stage before it goes to production? And should the test stage reviewers uh, have access to the whole pipeline? Uh, also, there are some other questions to keep in mind. Uh, Another thing that is very important regarding deployment pipelines is uh, uh, using parameters uh, uh, in your data model because you can't edit uh, data sets, data sources in Power BI service. It is a recommended practice to use parameters to store connection details, uh, such as, for example, instance names or database names instead of using a static connection string. And this allows you to manage connections through the Power BI service web portal or using APIs at a later stage. Uh, in deployment pipelines, you can configure parameter rules to set specific values for the development, for the test and for production stage. If you don't use parameters for your connection string, you can define uh, data source rules to specify connection string for a given data set. And finally, you can leverage deployment pipelines Power, uh, with Power BI uh, uh, REST APIs and to integrate Power BI into your organization's automate, automation process. A uh, few examples uh, of what can be done using the APIs uh, in synergy with pipelines is uh, you can manage pipelines from start to, to the end, including creating pipeline, assigning a workspace to, us, to, to any stage, uh, deploy, delete pipeline. Uh, you can also assign and unassign users to a pipeline. Uh, you can also, what is important, uh, integrate, especially important in enterprise, uh, uh, in the enterprise environments, you can integrate Power BI into uh, Azure DevOps uh, uh, or GitHub Actions, for example, and you can also schedule pipeline deployments to happen automatically at a given time. And finally, you can deploy multiple pipelines uh, at the same time. Uh, final remark regarding deployment pipelines, if you can click Rishi, please. This is premium only feature. So if uh, we are talking about pro license, there is no deployment pipelines. Keep that in mind. Yeah, although you can do you can do it through DevOps without a premium license, right? You can publish essentially what deployment pipelines does is just create free copies of your workspace, one dev, one test, one prod, and then allows you to automate the deployment of artifacts between those and you can change the parameters between them. Now, you've always been able to do that in a code based way using DevOps and PowerShell and things like that. Um, this has brought it with a UI essentially and made it available within the Power BI service directly. So for that, yeah, you need premium. But um, and, I mean, if you're working with those kind of data models, you probably want premium anyway, but it is possible without premium. Um, there's a question around. So does that mean you do not need to be a Power BI admin to be able to manage deployment pipelines? Uh, you do need to be an admin of the workspace. Admin of the workspace, not a Power yeah. BI tenant admin, though, right? 
Uh, no, no, no. Power BI tenant, no, no. So just yeah. of this workspace. Yeah, just in the workspace. Okay, great. So over to Andy on some integrating Power BI workspace with Synapse Analytics. Thanks very much. Good stuff, uh, Nicola. I think this was the slide for our crossover as well. Now, <clears throat> yes, there is some integration between Synapse Analytics Studio, which is the web-based interface that you can use to author SQL scripts, create data flows, etc. And you can add multiple workspaces into Synapse Studio, and you can actually author data sets and modify uh, and create and edit reports within Synapse Studio itself. Now, it will generate what's called a, a PBIDS file, which is just a data connection file that will then download and you can open up Power BI Desktop, which will have a connection to that Synapse resource, which will be a, a dedicated SQL pool or a serverless SQL pool. And you can upload those data sets to the workspace, which is linked into Synapse Studio itself. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Oh, Rishi. That was, that was the last one. And it was uh, Nicola's slide. <laughs> so we've got a quiz. We've got a quiz. I think is that, that was it for, for part one. So obviously there's a lot more coming in Synapse than the next module, which is about querying and transforming data. But this one is just about kind of, yes, yeah, so governance, deployment pipeline. So there's quite a lot even in this one, right? Application lifecycle management, where we're all there. Right. So, um, yeah, time for some questions. Now, two things to say about these questions. Number one, obviously, I've, you know, it's a very broad syllabus and I've only captured a very small amount of, of the kind of syllabus here in these questions. And the second thing is that um, I have made them, I have tried to make them quite challenging. And I did this with the um, PL300 ones as well, um, you know, a little bit harder than the real exam because I don't want people to be in a situation where, you know, they've aced all the questions and they think they could do it and then they get to the real exam and it's a lot harder. So I, I've heard on the other side where I can, and, and that's been a challenge for DP500. But let me just go to the, to the website. So I've published these on my website, this eight sample, eight quiz sample. So you can you can go and see these yourself at any point and it's, it's all for free. So let's start with the first question. All right, and it's, sorry, it's very small. Let me zoom in. Right, so you want to get a view of the data sources in your environment organized into logical connections as shown in the attached image. I'll click to zoom in a minute. Where would you find this information in Azure Purview? So let me click on here. So this is, where can you find this in Azure Purview? So we've got here, we've got some data sources. We've got some of these. Is it data map, data catalog, glossary, insights or management? And if you just bear me one second, I'm just going to launch the poll to ask the question. That should pop up on your screen. This one here. So A is data map, B is data catalog, C is glossary, D is insights and E is management. Interesting distribution. <laughs> 60, 40, okay, 50, 50. <laughs> data map or data catalog, yeah. To be fair, they both, they both sound quite plausible, right? Cool, okay. Oh, I was gonna go with the majority. So I need someone else to vote, one of them, please. <laughs> I'll do one. There you go, okay, A's, A's winning now. So I'm going to go with the majority answer. And it's a narrow majority, but the majority was data map. So let's go with that. And yeah, that's absolutely data map. So data map is data assets plus lineage plus classifications plus business context. So it kind of gives you that, that overall view. Um, so you can identify the type of data source and allows you to use collections. So those collections we saw at the top um, here, these collections are way off grouping assets into those categories so you can kind of um, group them together into this is all the ones that relate to sales data this is all the ones that relate to this type of data um, and there's a link there for azure purview which just points you to microsoft docs if you come back and try this yourself later okay next question 
What does it mean to configure data flow storage under the Azure Connections tab of the Workspace Settings? So under the Workspace Settings, we have this Azure Connections tab. What does that mean? Does it allow you to set your data flows to connect via a gateway, Azure Gateway, rather than connected data source? Does it allow you to use the Vertipack engine to store your data flow outputs rather than blob storage? Does it store them in your organization's own Azure Data Lake Gen 2 account? Or does it enable large data set mode for your data flow outputs? So again, I'm just going to launch the poll. And we've only got four options here this time. Oops, sorry, just give me one second. That should pop up on your screen now. So A is Azure Gateway, B is Vertipack Engine, C is your own organization's Data Lake Gen 2 account, and D is large data set mode. Cast your votes now. I love that cruise times. <laughs> oh, we've got an overwhelming majority for C. OK, I think that's I think that's a good enough majority. Yep, so let's go with C. Store the outputs of your data flow on each refresh. And if we just click on submit there, yeah, absolutely. Well done, everyone. So that means that this means that you can connect it to your own Azure Data Lake. Now, you can actually specify that Data Lake Gen 2 account at a tenant level um, in the tenant settings, and you can specify the storage account. Um, and then on an individual workspace level, you can choose to use that tenant wide one. And I think actually in tenant settings, you can, you can enforce it either way, but either you, in the workspace level, either you could use the one that's set a tenant or you can choose one for your own workspace if it's been allowed by the tenant settings. So um, yeah, absolutely. And so the advantage of doing this, by the way, is that you're making the output. So you, if you think about it, you're taking your data from a source system, say SQL Server or something, you're applying some cleaning, some data shaping, and then you want that cleaned, transformed, shaped data to be available to the rest of the organization. Right, and to other Azure processes. So maybe to data scientists, right? Rather than connecting to the raw messy data in, in, in SQL, you want to connect to the data that's actually been shaped and transformed and is more usable. So by putting it using a data flow and connecting your own Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage account to it, they can access that data directly from Data Lake. Uh, by default, if you don't specify your own Data Lake storage account, it is still stored in ADLS Gen 2, but it's completely behind the scenes. You can't access the data that's in Data Lake. You can only access it via the data flow connector. So that would be the advantage of, of using this feature. Um, and there's more, more details to read on that there. All right, so now those are the two questions for number one, and well done. I think we um, uh, we, we did quite well with that, actually. So yeah, back to, back to the slides. Any other questions on that? On anything we've covered so far? We are good to go, Rishi. Good, OK. How, uh, what time did you actually put this meetup for, by the way? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just conscious of the time. We are conscious of the time. Yeah, sorry. I know we, we probably should, I think we did talk about putting it, extending this meetup because there's a lot of content here, right? So, yeah, we, let's we go through where we can. If people do need to jump worry. off at seven, obviously that's that's fine. But if you can stay, we will we will be running over okay. <laughs> um, almost certainly. OK, so we're on to Synapse Analytics. So one of the things to note is this is not the DP, uh, I think it's the DP200 certification, which is the data engineering certification. So, you know, this is something in which we're uh, looking at uh, just using. Uh, sorry, DP203 certification. Yeah, yeah I just put it in the So chat. it's not something that we're, uh, you know, we're looking to deep dive into data engineering, but an appreciation of the dedicated and the serverless SQL pools service is um, is useful. OK, so next slide, please. I'm just going to close uh, a window. Sorry about this. Was talking about a window on his computer. I was like, that should be easy enough. Someone's decided to aggressively cut their grass outside. So we've got dedicated and serverless SQL pools. So we've got two SQL pools services that can connect, that can be connected to from Power BI. And the differences are 
with dedicated SQL pools, we've actually got a service in which we are ingesting data into the service itself. So it's like, well, it's it's a it's a little bit like a SQL Server or an Azure SQL database, except as a a hugely scalable service. But we are importing data into the service itself. It does support a large amount of data, and really the use case of dedicated is around a terabyte or more uh, of data because it's a you know it's a, a massively parallel processing system. However, we do have some concurrency um, to uh, to address because we can scale the dedicated SQL pool service in terms of compute and you know and RAM. We get certain amounts of concurrency with that as well. So it starts at four, and I know it's hard to believe, but four concurrent queries, and that will scale linearly up to a certain point. But also in that service, it's got support for features like data masking and column level encryption. So essentially, you can mask your data, you can encrypt your data within a dedicated SQL pool. And yeah, I can see that you've uh, just posted um, Mark Price Mayer's um, introduction to Synapse Analytics, which is well worth well worth a watch. Um, you know, Mark and I co uh, uh, co organise um, the uh, the Data Toboggan Synapse Analytics conference. Now, with serverless, we don't actually import any data into the serverless. SQL pool itself. It is merely a SQL based engine to query data external. OK, so we don't import data into serverless. We can connect to Azure Storage, Data Lake Gen 1, Data Lake Gen 2, the Dataverse and Cosmos DB, and we can create external tables and views. Now, an external table is essentially a schema construct over data that sits, well, external to serverless. OK. So they're the important differences between those two services. So if you go into the next slide, please, Rishi. Now, with serverless SQL pools, some of the most important aspects are to understand the open row set command. This is the command that underpins how serverless talks to external sources. OK, so within the open row set command is statements like location where you specify where the data is that you would like to read but also the format of the data as well is it a delimited file is it a parquet file is it delta format we also have functions like file path and file name which are sql based functions and these can be used to get metadata about the external data itself OK, so you can use those file path functions to actually query specific folders in in the data lake. And the cost of serverless SQL pools is all based on the amount of data that you're processing, not the uptime of the service, because it's always there. It's on demand. It's not based on any form of compute tier because you have no control over how much compute serverless SQL pools provisions when it runs a query. It's all behind the scenes. It's literally how much data you're processing. So it's around a five dollars for a terabyte of data. OK, and as I said, there's no configuration of serverless required as well. You set up a Synapse Analytics workspace and you get serverless SQL pools out of the box, ready to go. So next slide, please. You should be on. Uh, yeah, so. Um, if we just go back very quickly. Yep. So all the various different aspects of serverless SQL pools that we can read from and we can actually write data back to Azure Storage as well using a create external table as select a CTAS statement. And ultimately, serverless SQL pools exposes a SQL endpoint that you can connect to. OK, so next slide, please. OK. Now we can query uh, complex data. So I did get a couple of questions in the exam crop up around querying JSON 
using serverless SQL pools. So it's definitely worth just having a little look and getting yourself familiar around uh, JSON value, uh, JSON query, because JSON value, it extracts uh, a scalar value from JSON data, whereas JSON query, if there's an array of, uh, of values within a JSON document, that can help you extract those values as well. And that's also supported in Parquet as well. So Parquet, it has you know the concept of nested data within it as well. So definitely upskill a little bit in JSON value and JSON query. So next slide, please, Rishi. OK, now we have a predict function within dedicated SQL pools. So within Azure Synapse Analytics, there is some integration with Azure Machine Learning. But actually, within dedicated SQL pools itself, we can run a T-SQL function called predict. Now, again, I had a couple of questions on this. One was about the runtime. There's only one time, one runtime supported at the moment, which is uh, Onyx. And when you want to predict, when you want to use uh, a machine learning model, the very first thing you've got to do is you've actually got to declare a var binary max variable to load that model into. Then you can build up the data that you would like to uh, score in a with statement and use the predict keyword pass in parameters like the model, like the data that you would like to predict and the runtime, which is Onyx at the moment. So uh, next uh, slide, please. So I think that's it for the Synapse side of things at the moment. So I'm going to hand back over to uh, Nicola. Question Thanks, from Andrew. Mary Andy. So, sorry, what does Onyx mean? Yeah, I was just going to put a link in the chat to, to it. Yeah. Probably not the easiest thing to just explain, is it? I'm going to put the link in the chat. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. Amazing stuff. Always something to learn from you. Yeah. Uh, so we are now talking about data refresh performance in Power BI uh, as a, another very important topic in uh, enterprise scale uh, solutions. So for some data sources, such as mostly relational databases, but also some non-relational data sources, for example, all data, uh, Active Directory or Exchange, uh, Power Query Smash Up Engine is able to translate DM language that you uh, wrote or generated by uh, applying some transformations within Power Query Editor. So this engine is able to translate DM language to a language that this underlying data source will understand. In most cases, we are talking about SQL, of course. Uh, what's what's the big deal? What's the advantage of uh, having this feature uh, uh, available? Well, by pushing those complex calculations and transformations directly to a data source, Power Query uh, leverages capabilities of those uh, robust relational database engines that are built to cope with large volumes of data in the most efficient way. And that ability of Power Query's Meshup engine to create a single SQL statement, combining all M statements uh, behind your transformations is what we call a query folding. Or let's make it simple. If the Meshup engine is able to generate a single SQL query that is going to be executed on the data source side, then we, talk, we, we say that our query folds. Uh, can you please move to the next one, Rishi? Yeah, so as we explain what is query folding, let's examine why is it important to uh, achieve this behavior. Or maybe it's better to say, why should you care, care if your query folds or not? Uh, first of all, when you are using import mode in Power BI, uh, data, the, the whole data refresh process will uh, work more efficient than uh, the query faults, both in terms of refresh speed and resource consumption. If you are working with direct query or dual storage mode, and you are in those uh, circumstances, you are targeting SQL database directly, your query must fold or your solution will not work. And finally, uh, query folding is also of key importance for incremental refresh feature. It is so important that Power BI will uh, send you the warning once it determines that query folding can't be achieved. Uh, it will not break the incremental refresh process per se, 
but without query folding in place, uh, incremental refresh wouldn't serve its main purpose uh, uh, to reduce the amount of data that needs to be refreshed in your data model. Because without query folding, Meshup Engine needs to retrieve all data from the source and then apply subsequent steps to filter and transform the data. Uh, with all this in mind, you should tend to achieve query folding whenever possible. And one important disclaimer here, and this is one of key takeaways, I would say, from this section. If your report is slow or your visuals need a lot of time to render or your data model size is large, uh, query folding has nothing to do with it. So only if your data refresh or incremental refresh is slow and inefficient, you should investigate your Power Query steps in more depth. Uh, can we go to, yeah, to the next one? So it's not because of, yeah. Uh, another thing to keep in mind that uh, query folding is not all or nothing process. Uh, that means if you have, uh, can you please click again, Rishi? Sorry. Yeah. So if you have uh, uh, eight transformation steps and your query folding is broken at fifth step, all previous steps will fold. But once your folding is broken, it can't be achieved again. So even if your transformations uh, support query folding by default in steps six to eight, like in our example, where filtering should be a foldable step, these steps will not be folded. And keep that in mind and try to push all non-foldable steps uh, down this pipeline as much as possible. Uh, okay, we can go to the next one. Direct query, also very uh, important to understand when to use it, so that's that should not be your default option, uh, never ever. Uh, to cut the story short here, you should use Direct Query literally in three and only three scenarios. First, your data size is so large that you simply can't import it in Power BI. Uh, then the next one requirement to have near real-time reporting solution. As uh, we've already discussed and learned previously, when you use import mode, Power BI keeps the snapshot of your data. Now, let's say that the business requirement or the requirement in uh, the case study in the exam is to have data in the report with maximum one minute latency. Obviously, you can't refresh data so frequently uh, to satisfy this request. However, what I like to say here, uh, don't fall easy to this trap if your users request real-time data. Explain to them all the downsides of uh, direct query mode, and uh, from my experience, in 99% of cases, users will uh, confirm that maybe they don't need uh, really real-time data. And finally, security policies uh, the source side in customers' credentials uh, will be propagated to this underlying data source, and security rules will be applied there. Uh, we can go to the next slide. This time. This time again. Cool. Cool. Um, we just got a couple of questions in the chat before. So we're saying, yeah, once you break query folding, we can't recover it. Yeah, is that that's right? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, that's that's true. So basically, uh, if you identify the step that breaks query folding, try to move it down the pipeline as much as possible. So move those foldable steps. All the foldable steps keep on top. In yeah. case you need to use some transformation that breaks query folding and you need to keep it, just pull it down. Yeah, absolutely. OK, great. So now we're on to the quiz questions for the third topic. So second topic, sorry, even. Right, so we want to store data in Azure Data Lake Gen 2 and query it with a SQL serverless pool. Would it be more efficient to store it in CSV or Parquet format? So option A is more efficient to store it in Parquet because the files are better compressed, it's column based, and it has the schema for the data already built in. B, more efficient to store it in CSV because the files are better compressed with CSV format. C, more efficient to store it in CSV because it's more native to Azure Synapse. Or D, it makes absolutely no difference which format they're in. So just about to launch this question. So I keep scrolling to the bottom, so I have to keep going back up. So A is Parquet, B is CSV because of compression, C is CSV because it's more native to Synapse, or D is it makes no difference.
got a little bit of a mix. Andy, what's your view on this? You're on mute, by the way. I should unmute my mic. Um, it would be A. So Parquet is a column columnar storage format in which it's actually compressing the data within the file itself. Whereas CSV, it's a CSV file. There's no compression there whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. And and just out of interest, if you're also comparing Excel to CSV in Power BI Desktop, CSV is much faster than Excel. So Excel is by far the slowest format. <laughs> just out of, uh, out of interest. So yeah, I'm going to submit mine as well. And then let's submit that. Absolutely. So it's more cost efficient as well. So cost efficient. I mean, given that you're query, um, it's how much data you, you're querying, it's much better to store your data in Parquet format if you can. Um, so less data is read when you query compressed and column based formats like Parquet compared to CSV format. So yeah, we've got 75% there who, who got that right. So well done. And now we've got a nice, a nice long one that's uh, to do with Power Query. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to read this one because And then, you know, I just dropped your message on Teams. Then, if you've seen it, see it. You can't see it. No. Okay, never mind. So we've got this formula firewall error and it references other queries or steps. Is it because you're trying to access an on-premise data source without a gateway? Is it because, and I'll put the point up actually, is it because the power, there's a Power Query data firewall that is preventing partitions from um, being able to access data sources? Is it because sensitivity labels or is it because of Azure Private Link? So that should be coming up now. And most people are going to be Power Query Data Firewall. Have you come across the Power Query Data Firewall before, Andy, Nicola, Khalil? Yeah. No, can't remember. Can't say I have. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Let's go with B then. I think. Oh, actually, that that comment has has, has encouraged a few more people to to to, to go for A. We'll see. Now I know what the answer is, but I would have gone with a uh, another particular answer. What so after you've you well, I'm not going to say until you've answered the question. We've got we've got ten responses. I think we'll call it there. Yeah. So we're gonna, I think we're going to go with B because that's seventy percent. But what would you have gone with? So I've picked C, but I would have gone with A. You picked sensitivity labels. Yes. You, okay. You would have gone with A. But okay. I would have gone. I would have gone with A actually. Okay. Interesting. So most people have gone for B about the Power Query data firewall. But okay. Interesting. Nicola, what's your view? I would go for B because it's the longest answer. So <laughs> <laughs> when I don't know the answer, I'm going always for the longest one. Way, yeah, honestly, way. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I, I don't know. Honestly. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's see if 70% of our of our participants have got it right. And yes, it's actually there is such a thing as the Power Query Data Firewall. Yeah. Um, what this essentially is, is around trying to prevent data leakage. So essentially, say you've got, um, say you're doing a join, right? So you've got some, some a, a SQL database that's got all of your employees and their salaries in there. And then you've got an Excel file with a list of some employee IDs and you're doing a merge between them. Now, essentially what that allow what that's enabling you to do essentially is bring da sensitive data potentially into your power bi and combine it with less sensitive data 
potentially. Um, and that gives you the opportunity for data leakage because you're combining data from two different sources that are potentially, you know, need to have different rules applied to them. So um, there are things around privacy settings and you need to make sure that the data source is the same privacy settings. But the other thing around this is when you have a power query, it's split out into partitions. So partitions is basically a set of steps and a, a set of kind of um, queries essentially that, that that it breaks up your chunks up your um your power query into if you ever go into diagnostics into the power query you can see what all of those partitions are so this is one of the reasons i mean i'm sure lots of people have come across this error if you've been working with power query i had it yesterday actually and it was it's, it's frustrating um but one of the ways to try and avoid it is to actually utilize staging queries so you say okay let's create a query that has nothing but my connection to the data source in there. So it doesn't have any transformations or anything like that. Um, and then let's reference that um, in order to then um, be able to then work out, uh, so to do the transformations on those rather than trying to do it all in one query. That has other benefits in terms of readability and maintenance and things like that as well. Um, but it's also one of the things that can help avoid one of these errors. And there is a very, very detailed article. I'm actually going to open it up. Oh, OK. Data privacy firewall. So, OK, I've got the wrong link in my um, in my quiz. So it's actually um, in Microsoft Docs, they've got. I did actually read through this and it took me yeah, behind the scenes of the data privacy firewall. So I'm going to put this link in the chat. It's if you are struggling to go to sleep, it's definitely a good a good mm -hmm. fix for that. Um, so. Yeah, it talks about query folding because again, it's it's kind of related. What is a partition? Partitions that reference other partitions, and you know they've done a good job here of actually giving you some proper examples mm -hmm. around where that firewall sits into it. But yeah, absolutely, that's uh, well done there. At least we got we got most of that right. Um, right, so <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say actually we are only halfway through the session. I, I mean, I'm happy to carry on. I was just wondering, hello. I mean, if people do need to drop off. We could potentially split the session into two. Uh, Do you, I'm really what, not sure about that, but uh, it's totally up to us and the audience. Maybe yeah. we should continue. It might be better way to 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 keep to continue. Things, I mean, yeah, organized. Unless, unless we wanted to do a quick poll on it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Why, well, right. why not? Maybe we can right. give then, a five minutes break for smoking, let's say, and then we can continue. And I will cut that session from the recording. OK, that's fine. So let's um, I'm just going to put a quick poll and okay. say, should we continue or split the session into two? I mean, also, it is a lot for people to take in. Right? Definitely. So just um, keep in mind that I'm on holidays uh, by the end of the next week. Sure, sure. Yeah, <laughs> but you, yeah, I mean, you can continue without me. No, no, no. I mean, we'll do it. We'll do it according to availability, obviously. Um, so let me just put this on. OK, I'll launch it now. And yep, let's take a, a couple of minutes break, like just maybe two, three minutes. Oh, well, I think actually it's quite <laughs> you had a miss already, actually. So let's carry on. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Next next section is implement and manage data models. Um, so composite models over to you. Yeah, Nicola. thank you. Thanks, Rishi. So uh, what are the composite models? Uh, first, in the dark ages of Power BI, which was not so long ago. If you wanted to use direct query as a source for your report, uh, once you chose entire query for a certain data source like SQL Server, for example, the possibility to, ex to extend on this was gone. Uh, to put it simple, you couldn't combine a direct query uh, over one data source like SQL Server with a direct query over another data source 
think of Oracle, for example, and let alone combine direct query with import mode. Uh, luckily, these times are long behind us as uh, now you can create a data model in Power BI that consists of, let's say, uh, data coming from the Excel file stored on your local machine, imported data from the SQL Server table, direct query that retrieves the data from another SQL Server table, direct query that retrieves the data from Oracle database table, for example. All imported data sources, uh, like in our example, uh, Excel file and imported SQL Server table uh, data in our case, are being treated as one single artifact uh, from composite models perspective because the data is stored in the local instance of analysis services that Power BI uses to store imported data. Uh, so from a composite model perspective, that's one source. Uh, in the illustration, you see there are two direct query data sources, uh, SQL Server and Oracle, and each of them containing data from multiple tables. The power of composite models is that now you can establish a relationship between the data stored in Vertipack, which is imported data, and data that resides outside of Power BI. If you ask yourself uh, why some arrows are dashed and the others not, that's a great question. So those arrows uh, represent relationship between the tables in different storage environments. Uh, tabular model supports two types of relationships, regular and limited. You may also uh, hear uh, terms like strong and weak re relationships. So explaining the behavior, considerations, limitations of these two types, especially limitations when it comes to limited, uh, limited relationships, uh, is out of the scope of our session today. But uh, there are some resources that you can refer to, especially great article from SQL BI guys, on uh, this topic to understand all the nuances and potential caveats uh, when working with limited relationships. To cut the story short from the perspective of successful Power BI developer, uh, you should keep in mind two things. You can create relationships between the data coming from different storage mode sources, but you must be aware of the behavior of these relationships. We can go to the next slide. Uh, so aggregations usually come uh, as a, a subsequent feature to composite models, and uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are two different types of aggregations in Power BI. Uh, User-defined aggregations uh, were up until a few months ago the only aggregation type in Power BI. Here you are in charge of defining and managing aggregations, even though Power BI later automatically identifies aggregations when executing your query. And automatic aggregations, a relatively new feature in Power BI, I think it went uh, to general availability last month or something like that. Uh, with automatic uh, aggregations feature enabled, you can grab a coffee, sit and relax as machine learning algorithms will collect the data about the most frequently running queries in your reports and automatically build aggregations to support those queries. Uh, the important difference between these two types, of course, besides the fact that with automatic, uh, automatic aggregations, you don't need to do anything except to turn this feature on in your tenant, is licensing limitations. Uh, User-defined aggregations will work both in premium and pro, while automatic aggregations at this moment require uh, premium license. And from now on, we will talk only about user-defined aggregations, just, just to be uh, clear on that. Uh, well, if you're wondering what's the important, wh what's the what's the point in aggregating the data, uh, can you, sorry, Rishi, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so what's the point? Well, the final goal is to reduce the number of rows and consequentially reduce the overall data model size by preparing the data in advance. So if I need to go and see total sales amount spent by customer X on product Y in the first quarter of this year, I can take, take advantage of having this data already summarized in advance. Uh, what's the key ingredient here uh, when it comes to aggregations is that uh, creating aggregations per se is not enough to speed up your Power BI reports. You need to make Power BI aware of these aggregations. Uh, so you do it this by manage aggregations option uh, in Power BI and uh, 
just one remark, very important remark before, before we proceed further. Aggregation awareness is something that will work only and only if the original fact table uses direct query storage mode. That's important to, to, to remember. Uh, we will come later to explain how to design and manage aggregations and how to set proper storage mode for your tables. At this moment, just keep in mind that the original fact table should be in direct query storage mode. So in most usual use case for aggregations in Power BI, your tables should be in the following, so you should be using following storage modes. Your original table, as I said, in direct query storage mode, Dimension, dimension tables should be in dual storage mode. Dual storage mode means that data is being loaded into Power BI, but it's also it also says, can be served directly from the data source. Depending uh, if your query targets uh, imported data from aggregated table or goes directly to uh, to a data source, and of course aggregated tables should use import mode to uh, take advantage of of uh, performance of the. Uh, data which is stored in cache memory of the Vertipack database. Uh, I think that's it. We can go to the next one. Uh, yeah, I think we switched the slides. That's the thing I already uh, talked about. Well, yeah. So I guess was this was in this talking about the fact that you've got direct query against like a SQL source against relational sources, which is your original composite model, but you've also got direct query against analysis services or Power BI data sets. Is that is that not, I yeah, exactly that. those those yeah. two versions of composite models? The the newer one, the, the second version is exactly what you said. It's with this strange name, direct query over uh Power BI data sets and analysis services. Uh it's still in public preview, so uh it will not be, I think, part of the exams. Uh not at this yeah. moment. I, I oh, suppose got it. Got it. Yeah, it's okay. still in public preview. It's very powerful feature. But uh, we can talk about it. But uh, as yeah. it's not part of the exam, I would rather sure. skip okay. it. Sorry, right. Sorry, I thought no, it, I thought no, it was no problem. For some reason. Great point. Great um, point. Great point. Yeah. Sure. Great point. Um, and just I'll put a link in the chat as well. I did a video on um, New York City taxi data and taking 2.4 billion rows of data through Azure Synapse um, pipelines, Delta Lake, and using aggregations on there. So um, if you're interested in the kind of real life example, it's not that real life, but you know, a real life example of, of taking data all the way using synapse and aggregations, then um, yeah, have a look at the video. And um, I've also, um, I'm doing a blog post series on it and I'll put the first blog post series out today or tomorrow morning. So yeah, just follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter and I'll, I'll make sure I post about it when it's out. So carry on. Thanks, thanks Rishi, thanks. Uh, okay, the next thing, uh, talking about a little bit about DEX. So as a DEX newbie, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that you don't need variables. Uh, simply said, why would you care about the variables when your DEX formulas consists of one or two lines of code? However, as time goes by uh, and you start writing more and more complex calculations, you will start to appreciate the concept of variables. And when I say more complex calculations, I mean using nested functions and possible reusing of the expression logic. Uh, moreover, in many cases, variables may significantly improve the performance of your calculation as this expression will be evaluated by the engine only once instead of multiple times. Uh, finally, using variables will enable you to easier read and debug the code and verify results for the specific parts of your formula. Uh, you can see on your screen a simple example of using variables in your DEX code. Uh, next thing, uh, when it comes to handling blanks, uh, there are multiple ways to do it in DEX. Uh, two com most common ways are using an if statement and then checking if the certain expression within the if statement evaluates to blank. And you can also use a more elegant solution with coalesce function. Uh, for those coming from the SQL world, this is a well-known function, but let me briefly explain for those uh, who are not familiar with it. Basically, Coalesc will uh, go through the values passed as arguments uh, uh, in the function and return the first non-blank value. However, and this is important, be very careful if you're trying to replace blanks in your DEX formulas because that can uh, neglect the engine's capability to include the non uh, non-empty implicit filter, which essentially excludes the rows where there are no matching records. That's some internal optimization uh, within the engine. Uh, 
once you replace the blank with some explicit value, for example, zero or something like that, you will get a full cross join query of dimension tables, which will potentially decrease the query performance. So avoid avoid replacing blanks with some explicit values. OK, I think we can go to the next one. Uh, this one is uh, related to creating reusable assets in Power BI. So there are basically three types of assets that you can create uh, in Power BI. First is well-known PBIX file, uh, which uh, basically uh, consists of uh, all the data about connections, data sets, transformations, visualizations, including the data. That's important. So your PBIX file always conclude, always include real data. Uh, on the other hand, PBIT uh, stands for Power BI template file. It doesn't contain any real data, so it contains only metadata, which is data about your data, uh, like data model, pages in the report, and so on, but no real data. And finally, PBI DS, uh, which stands for Power BI uh, data source file, which basically saves only the link to the data source which is used in the file. Uh, that's it, I think, regarding creating reusable assets. We can go uh, further. External tools, this is one of my favorite topics, uh, I would say. So what are external tools? Those are mostly mostly free tools that provide additional capabilities and or is development process in the Power BI ecosystem. Keep in mind, since they are developed by third party contributors, external tools come with one serious limitation. They are not officially supported by Microsoft. However, that doesn't or let's say shouldn't minimize their importance uh, especially for some common business tasks, common business scenarios where Power BI de Desktop simply can't accomplish this task. Uh, first, let's discuss DAX Studio. If you can uh, go to the next one, she thinks. Uh, DAX Studio is a very comprehensive external tool created by Darren Gosbell. You can use DAX Studio to write DAX, to perform different kind of uh, diagnoses, uh, to capture query plans, uh, understand the time spent between uh, uh, Vertipex formula engine and storage engine. You can troubleshoot performance, format your DAX code, and many, many, many more things. Uh, DAX Studio is such an awesome tool that I would say deserves a, a dedicated 60 minute session. Okay, next one, please. Tabular Editor also deserves a 60 minute session. It was created by Daniel Otikir. And this is definitely a go-to tool for data modeling, not just for data modeling, but uh, uh, predominantly for data modeling. Not just that it supports some of the most popular features, such as uh, creating and managing calculation groups and setting the object level security, which can't be nat natively performed uh, from Power BI Desktop. So you must use tool like a tabular editor. Tabular editor provides a whole range of features to speed up your day-to-day -day Power BI development. Same as for DAX Studio, as I said, Tabular Editor deserves a dedicated session. At this point, keep in mind that uh, there are two versions of Tabular Editor. Tabular Editor 2, which is a free version and supports most of the required development tasks. And uh, during the exam, uh, you, you, all the topics are covered with Tabular Editor 2. And Tabular Editor 3, which is a commercial version, so you need to pay for license. Uh, and it provides many advanced features. In my humble opinion, Tabular Editor 3 is well worth investment that will pay off uh, uh, in the longer run, definitely, because it will save you hours of uh, Power BI work. Uh, OK, maybe we can go next to the next one. Thank you. Uh, Vertipack Analyzer, uh, when you want to understand data storage structures inside the Vertipack uh, database, there is no better tool than Vertipack Analyzer. Essentially, what Vertipack Analyzer does, uh, it collects data from multiple dynamic management views. So in theory, you can also uh, run those dynamic management views from, let's say, SQL Server Management Studio and get exactly the same data. But with Vertipack Analyzer, you get this data in a more structured, more readable, more convenient way uh, uh, that if you go and query all those dynamic management views on your own. Uh, Vertipack Analyzer is especially useful when you need to determine the data model size as it enables you to understand the size of different data model objects, such as tables, columns, relationships, partitions, and so on. 
Uh, we can go to the next one. Oh, again, quiz. I like this <laughs> okay. one. Thanks. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there was performance as well, right? Uh, did we cover performance? Yeah, performance optimization. I guess that's kind of DAX Studio and uh, looking at some of that. Okay, good, good. All right. So, yeah, this is quite a broad topic again as well. Um, and um, yeah, I've covered some bits of it. So, there's two. By the way, you can see if you see at the top of the questions, what I've put in here is the heading, which is so if you go to the exam syllabus, you'll see there's different bullet points under under the syllabus so even under this module module three which is implemented design data models or something there's there's two bullet points so the first one is design and build tabular models so and the next one is optimize for performance so um this is the question on here let me i'll bring up the poll what is the primary information that external tools such as DAX studio and tabular editor could obtain from your power bi file loaded into Power BI Desktop. So when you when you open up Power BI Desktop and you load launch an external tool from Power BI Desktop, it can connect to that Power BI file that you've got open. What's the main bit of information that it, it connects to or information it gives you on your file? So is it details of all the visuals in each report page? Is it details of all the Power Query M code? Is it details of all the visual interactions, including bookmarks and navigation? Or is it access to analysis services engine that is run locally as part of Power BI Desktop to allow it to access the data model? And let me just bring that up. Hopefully you should see that now. Oh, OK, yeah. So we've got got more than 10 responses and overwhelmingly is doing D. I mean, I guess the fact that it's in this in, in module <laughs> might be the slight giveaway. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, these external tools are um, really designed, at, you know, managing your data model, not so much your your Power BI file. Um, so I'm not sure what's happened to the font there, but yeah, external tools um, allow access to that analysis services engine, which is actually a really interesting concept, right? There you've got this technology that's been around for like 20, 30 years. Um, and it's, you know, the Vertipack engine, which is where it takes data, compresses it, holds it in a format that's optimized for querying. And this is, you know, Microsoft's proprietary technology that has been installed on servers um, in multi-dimensional mode and then more recently in tabular mode um, on, you know, in SQL servers as part of the SQL server offering. And then with Power BI, what they've done is actually taken that engine and put it into the Power BI desktop application. So when you open up a file in Power BI desktop, it actually launches that analysis services, a mini version of analysis services on your machine, um, in, in memory on your machine. And that's what these tools then access when you're doing that. So quite fascinating. OK, um, and yeah, that's I think why I, you need laptops with a lot of RAM. You do actually, yeah. <laughs> if you're working with big data models, you do actually need laptops with a lot of RAM. Yeah. <laughs> OK, and this, and then this is the optimized enterprise scale data models. We did touch on that hugely in this session, but it is it is part of the exam. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to read that. How does the column based storage of Parquet files compare to Vertipack storage? I mean, it's it's quite different um, potentially. Um, Andy, do you want to take that one? I'm going to say cash in. I'm going to say C. Oh, right. OK, yep. And then on the question in the chat about how does Vertipack compare to Parquet columnar storage? They're both columnar storage, if you like. Let's have a look. Oh, there was a question before. Oh, how does the column based storage of Parquet files compare to Vertipack storage? Well, that's a great question. Well, yeah, I mean, they're both. Yes, yeah, so they're both columnar storage formats. One's file based and Vertipack yeah, one's, is. Well, you know, I mean, Parquet is like the ultimate in transportable um, data because it's got the data itself. It's got the schema. 
it's got the stats so you can literally point any data processing engine at parquet that supports it and you're up and running whereas obviously vertipack you know it's the uh, you know it's the proprietary engine right we uh, you know we're very beholden to the uh, the overlords at microsoft in terms of um you know the development of that engine Yeah, it'd be interesting. Maybe, maybe there might I mean, be. And again, some yeah. So, I mean, comparing. So, you know, for mm -hmm. example, you could probably have about four terabytes of, uh, you know, of Parquet data that you can query. Could you get the same amount into VertiPack? Mm. I'm going to say no. Because that's the thing about, you know, Parquet. It's like a, you know, because it exists as, you know, essentially separate files. I mean, you know, it's, well, I'm not, I'm not going to use the word limitless, but, you know, you can just scale out your data lake to hold, you know, a lot of data in Parquet format, whereas, yeah, VertiPack, smaller file loads. Yeah, I mean, VertiPack has a completely different set of optimizations that it uses for compression and yeah. um, and for you know for how it how it stores that data how it compresses it how it how it's optimized for that specific you know set of dax queries right so that the dax engine runs against vertipack right and if you're running dax against directly against park a files you're not going to get the same kind of performance right if you're doing direct query and sql serverless against park a it's just not gonna give you the same level of performance at all but that's right. That's not that's not a limitation of Parquet per se. It's it's the fact that Vertipack is its own engine. <laughs> it's it's so that's really limitless. How much money do you have? <laughs> yeah, my biggest bugbear with Microsoft marketing, I can't sell Synapse based on the uh, concept of saying it's limitless because a CTO or CIO is going to say no. What's the limits, Andy? And then you give them the limits. You can run these many queries. You can scale it to this much. You know, it will yeah. run this fast. Um, so yeah, there, there are some limits. All right then. So right. what are we so going to go C for in terms to be, of the question? Yep. Um, C seems to be overwhelming. So ninety percent. So let's go with C. The visual data engine cache. So not because of query folding, not because of auto ags, and not because of auto date time. And yep, that's right. So essentially, um, you know, I put some links to the various other things here. So when you're running performance analyzer it loads it into cache and it does do that with users as well when they're viewing reports there is a cache that's running there and it you know it does optimize it but when you're trying to optimize your queries or identify where there's bottlenecks you don't want to be doing it in those best case scenarios where there's a cache you actually want to be doing it old right so where there isn't a cache at all so what you need to do is each time you run performance analyzer create a blank page in Power BI Desktop, save, close the file, and then open it up, and it'll open up on that blank page, then start recording, and then navigate to the page that you want to see the performance of. So that's how you need to use um, the performance analyzer to be able to, to do that. And yeah, these these other features are different to so auto aggregations into direct query mode. Query folding is for passing those queries in Power Query back to the data source. So the Power Query engine doesn't have to do all of the work, and, and that's sufficient. And auto date time is one of those evil features in Power BI where it creates uh, a date time and a calendar table for every single date you've got in there. If you don't have your own calendar table or you haven't turned the feature off, um, so it could be it could be useful if you know you don't know how to create a calendar table and you you know you're quite new to it all and you just want to do some analysis. But you know try and avoid that if you can. And this is a link to learn more about performance analyzer. So yeah, I think we've got everything right so far, haven't we? OK, so now we're on to the last topic, and this one is relatively small, actually, so we're not going to overrun massively. Um, but yeah, let's. Uh, let's go into here. So this is again, there's a little bit of synapse um, and then a fair bit of Power BI as well in here. So over to you, Andy. OK, so. Let's make sure I'm not muted. Yeah, so pretty short one on here. We did actually have this conversation earlier about how much Python was actually in the exam. And I think at the beginning of the beta, there seemed to be quite a few Python questions and then they thinned out as the beta went along. We honestly don't know what happened. They might have reduced the amount of Python questions there. 
But anyway, in terms of visualizations, using Synapse Studio, so the you know the the web interface itself, we can actually create data visualizations in Spark notebooks. But we've got to import some libraries first. So you know we're going to import Matplotlib, Seaborn, and Pandas. Now Pandas is uh, you know loading data into a into a Pandas data frame. So we've got some data there in our second step. You know, I've just got some hard coded data into a data frame and then I've transformed that into a pandas data frame using the two pandas. Then I'm going to chart. OK, now a little bit uh, too much depth to go into, but if you uh, look at how to plot axis on charts, using um you know using the, uh, the 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 visualization libraries yeah so you can sort of understand how to set your um categories how to set your bins or the plot types um that could be useful but like i said it, there may be maybe a question in there around these uh, visualizations in spark notebooks if you go into the second slide rishi um, that's the result of the plot that we've got on the right hand side. Um, yeah, so next slide. Now in Synapse Studio with the SQL pools, OK, so Spark pools, you know, we can use libraries to actually visualize. Yeah, so when you're, you know, you're, you're writing your um, um, Python, or your Scala or Spark SQL, then you can visualize using, you know, Matplotlib. But you can also visualize using the SQL pools result uh, screen. It's very basic. It really is. OK, and we've got some basic visualizations there in terms of chart types. So we've got area, bar, column, line, pie and scatter. You're not going to get sort of multi series with these charts. They're they're very basic. OK, but they're you know, and we, but we can visualize results um, from serverless SQL pools and dedicated SQL pools. OK, so if you want to move on, Rishi. Oh, and I think exactly we're back so. over to Nicola for accessibility. Yeah, exactly. It's just, sorry, just to, uh, revert it back. Or no, never mind. Never mind. Leave it as it is. Never mind. <laughs> because it should follow the talk, but never mind. Uh, yeah. So uh, where we are talking about accessibility, as you may know, the same report may look completely different across different devices. Let's say between desktop and uh, uh, so uh, desktop compared to a mobile phone or tablet or so on. Uh, similar similar applies to different persons, and you have to keep in mind that your users might have visual motor or cognitive impairments. Uh, so the same report may look different uh, from the perspective of users with deficiencies. And why accessibility matters? Uh, if you ask yourself this question, let me show you this uh, very simple example. If you are a normal person, and when I say normal, I mean you don't have any visual impairments, that's uh, on the left hand side, that's how you will see this nice balloon flying over green fields. Uh, if you are diagnosed with green blind or uh, uh, medicine name is deuteranopia, uh, then this same balloon looks pretty much different, I would say. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Richie, please? Thank you. Uh, so here is the list of uh, both built in and configurable uh, accessibility features in Power BI. Uh, of course, I will not go through and read uh, through those slides as you will get them after the session, uh, but keep in mind that you have both built in features for accessibility that are provided out of the box for you, and you also have some of them that you can configure additionally to make your reports uh, even more accessible. Uh, yeah, can you go to the ah, okay, that's Adjusted yeah, that's basically yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, so yeah, so we, yeah, visualization we've got, you know, 
R and Python. We've, they've got a bit of like paginated reports and things like that as well in the visualization section. Um, you've got R and Py or Python in, in terms of creating visuals, Python visuals in Power BI. And you've also got some of the querying um, in Synapse. So obviously when you create a serverless pool, you can query it and it can show you it as a graph, a very simple graph, like a bar chart or something like that. And you've also got the ability to query data using matplotlib, for example, which is a Python library. And you could run queries on that in um, against Synapse. Um, and you can also use Python as part of, you know, PySpark, which is essentially Python code running against the Spark pool. So we didn't really cover the Spark pool, but the Spark pool, there's three actual engines. One is dedicated, which is essentially SQL Data Warehouse, um, set, uh, which is, you know, the, it actually is SQL Data Warehouse. So it's they rebranded SQL Data Warehouse to dedicated serverless, uh, so, uh, dedicated pool in Synapse. Then you've got serverless, which is um, actually running, not actually having, you know, dedicated hardware for your for your SQL, but actually running it against files as if they were in the SQL database, essentially. And your third one is your Spark engine, which is essentially where you've got your multi-parallel kind of processing, but it's using the Spark kind of engine like Databricks does. Um, and you can run um, notebooks in there. And part of those notebooks, you can run your notebooks in Python, in SQL, or what else in there, in Spark. Scala. Itself. Scala, that's it, Scala. But so, luckily, you won't have to know how to do uh, any of that. Any of that spark. Is that there is a little bit of um Python notebook stuff there, isn't there? I just think. about the visualizations. Just about the visualizations. Yeah. Is there nothing to do with PySpark on Scala? I no, something. No. no. Okay. Fair enough. That's good. Um right. So now we're on to the last last set of questions. So we've got um in here, visualize data. So you want to make your report more accessible. What's the minimum color contrast ratio? Now, this is one of those things where you if you if you read it and you've learned it, you know it. If you're not, you, you're just gonna have to take a wild guess. Right. So again, it's one of those things where it's just, you know, there's some stuff in this exam where it's just book knowledge, right? It's just just learn it, right? And then, you know, try and remember it. Um, it's not, you know, it's not necessarily um, you know, to do with um kind of all the experience stuff. Most of the Power BI stuff you know, relates to things like that, you know, you would have some experience of working with Power BI. So, you know, in the last topic, um, there were topics like um, this, there's things like object level security in Power BI using Tableau Editor and things like that. You know, those are the kind of things like, how would you do it? Well, actually, you, you know, if you've been using Power BI for a while, you, you'd fairly, you'd be fairly familiar with that. Um, stuff like this, um, yeah, not, not so much. It's just kind of, you know, or, you know, and Mary says she knows it because she's a web developer. Yeah, actually, I mean, those standards that apply that Microsoft refer to for accessibility in Power BI are not just Power BI specific. They're web standards. I can't remember the exact acronym, WACG or something like that. There's web accessibility standards or guidelines. So what have we got? OK. Yeah, and also most questions in the exam are not necessarily like this. Um, I have put this just to test people, but you know, generally most of the questions in the exam are quite scenario based. Um, you know, so they give you a kind of scenario and say, how would you how would you deal with that? Oh, okay, we've got ten responses, and B four point five to one is the most common answer. Seventy percent of people have said that. And that is correct as well. So yeah, WCAG 2.1. There you go. Um, so yeah, it delineates that text and background color should have a contrast ratio of at least 4.5 to 1. So those are some tools there as well. Um, uh, you can, uh, we've got some, some nice code there. Um, but yeah, you've got some, um, some links there to some resources where you can check your report colors. So, you know, you could upload that image like Nicola had there for the hot air balloon and see how it would look for someone with um, uh, color blindness deficiency, for example. So it's a very good thing to do. Um, yep. OK, and then last question. Um, OK, so now we've got the code. So have a have a quick read of that code. And a lot of the questions around Python visualization isn't 
it's, it's they're all about matplotlib i think i don't think there's any other libraries really tested um but and it's more just about knowing what kinds of visuals this will produce or you know you want to show this kind of thing in matplotlib you know what kind of thing would you want to to show so that's this kind of question here um you know um, this is not a real exam question obviously but it, it's fairly similar to the type of thing you might have to do so if you have a read of the script and again you don't need to know what every little line in this code does right it's just getting a a rough idea of am I going to get two lines, three lines? Am I going to get a curve shape? Am I going to get, you know, that kind of thing? So if you just remember that, and then I'm going to click on each of these images, and we need to pick which one this will show. So this is the first one. This is A. So it's like a hyperbolic graph, I think is the term for this. We've then got three lines like that. We've then got three lines like that. Or we've got a single straight line. So, you know, you can see here we're doing. Um, yep, cool. Thank you. So we've got numpy, a range, x squared, plot and show. I'll click on those again just to, to get the hyperbolic graph. Three lines, three lines, and okay, I'll wait for one more response. Yep, turn responses, we're up to that. So, and 90% again have gone for A. So, I am pleased to say that we have got 100% on this quiz, <laughs> which was, which is impressive, actually. Um, when I take my own quizzes, I do not get 100%. <laughs> Are the questions that I wrote myself, by the way. So <laughs> that is that is very good. Collective knowledge. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Wisdom of the crowd, right? <laughs> that's uh, that's actually very true. That's I think the only thing I've ever won before was one of those things where you know you had to guess how many beans were in a jar. Um, obviously, I had absolutely no idea. Um, and the only way what I did is I, I looked at the, all the results I had them on a clipboard and I just summed them all up on my phone and took the average and put that as my answer and I won. Right. So it kind of shows you some people, you know, will guess a thousand, some people guess a hundred. And, you know, once you take the average of enough, you'll you'll get close enough to the right answer. So definitely, definitely wisdom of the crowd. Um, and there's a Can link. I add something? So, so, sorry, yeah, Rishi. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. No, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. This this is my opinion, and I, and, uh, I believe uh, I believe Rishi and then Nicola shared a similar thing. You you cannot know everything perfectly. I have no idea about what Matplot library is. I never touched that code, but I just use uh, use my common sense for some questions like this. There is some yeah. square of x. It shouldn't be linear. This is coming from my normal exactly. average math, math information. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, 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 exactly. And you can read, you know, something like this and you can see, you know, there's a line that says red, so it's going to give you a red line or, you know, how many lines you're going to get. Well, it depends how many it's kind of plotting. You can kind of see, right, this is plotting X and Y, right? So, you know, it, you're kind of, that's all you're plotting. You're not plotting separate series, you know, so that's exactly that kind of thing. It's just having a base understanding of those kind of concepts um which is, is really helpful um and yeah things like you know predict function again never came across it before <laughs> just just learn what it is and, and, and how it works and then you know the questions on the exam are not going to test you really beyond what you just read on microsoft docs right um and you know same for some of those other ones um even you know json open you know maybe even open row set json value all of those kind of things again hadn't really come across them before read a little about it. I mean, Andy's done some great videos and blogs on, on Jason as well. Um, and you're not going to get tested on anything that's beyond that. So there's a question about um, the quizzes. So if you go to learndatainsights.com um, and I'll put the link to the in the chat there. Um, and then if you scroll down here, we've got DP 500. So if you click here on L on LDI content. Um, yeah, let's put all the links to the chat in there. Actually, we've got some QR codes at the end. 
um, to just finish off the session. Um, and you'll see here I split the quizzes into into the four areas. Um, I've got these two uploading now. I'm writing this one at the moment and it, it's quite hard. I've got a couple of questions on there, um, but you know I, I, I'm getting there. Um, and so then you've got a five question quiz or a 10 question quiz. Um, and then we've got the ones there on, on the and I've got loads of questions on there on things like JSON value and things like that. So, um, yeah, let me open up those two blog posts, actually, because it's really worth. And do you want to have a if we can just do um, a quick a quick run through of these two blog posts? Um, sorry, serverlesssql.com. Yeah, so Andy, do you want to give a quick couple of minutes on these? You are mute. So if you click on that DP500 link, um, which one here? Yeah. Yeah. So the top one. So that's all the relevant content that I've got. So I've got purview. I've got query and partition sources in serverless. Uh, if you scroll down to the bottom, then the sec the uh, scroll up, then uh, yeah. So the new certification, Microsoft certified as your enterprise uh, analyst. So if you click on that blog, yeah. So essentially within there, if you scroll down, so it's just giving you some background uh, for the certification itself. So, yeah, the same content for the session. But if you scroll, keep scrolling down, then essentially on the skills measured, then here is the various documentation, Microsoft Docs and Learn courses that are relevant to each of those skills being measured. So if you need to dive into any one of those skills, then you've got some links there to the official Microsoft documentation. Um, so that's 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 it for me. And then I think, uh, Nicola, yeah, this is, you have... This is actually different to the stuff that's on the Microsoft page though as well, isn't it? Because you did this before those were written, right? Or those were published. Yes, published. yeah. So they were written. I, I so remember they're... seeing yours way before the actual... Yeah, so they've got some, they've got some, coll so they've got some collections, collections now. So, yeah, if you go... So, um... Yeah, if you go into the actual exam, so if you just type in Microsoft DP500, um, so you've got a study guide. Yeah. Um, and then you've got the which will give you the exam syllabus. You've got this exam sandbox. I haven't tried this yet, actually. I don't know what's in there. Um, but yeah, here you've got the collections. So you've got introduction to data analytics. You've got some purview yeah. stuff, synapse, tabular models and design and build tabular models. And then I think you've got some yeah, advanced data visualization yeah, stuff yeah. as well. All, I mean, all of those yeah. are links uh, in my blog. OK, brilliant. So yeah, maybe maybe my maybe Microsoft sneakily took all those links from my blog and collated them. I'm sure possibly. Never knows. Possibly. <laughs> never possibly. And, and then, then, yeah, uh, do you want to give a couple of minutes on data mode start, Nicola? Yeah, thanks, Rishi. Uh, if you go to this DP500 certification on the top, uh, in the top menu. Uh, courses, uh, yeah, DP500 yeah. certification, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so basically. I covered 50% of topics so far from the whole uh, uh, exam, and I'm now working on the remaining 50%. So uh, last to uh, implement and manage data models and uh, explore and visualize data, uh, I covered all the topics, so we, which are in the official uh, exam curriculum. And uh, yeah, I'm also trying to record some YouTube videos that doesn't go so fast, uh, requires some time, but uh, yeah, hopefully, I will I will be able to uh, complete soon uh, the the remaining topics from the exam. So it's not Microsoft documentation. It's how I see it. So basically, yeah, you can maybe combine both resources using also Learn Data Insights and uh, and yeah. uh, and this and these blogs and uh, YouTube videos, and that can give you like a, a, a better overview of all the topics. Yeah, these are really good. I mean, I, I like the way these are written. Um, you know, they're a little bit more, they're, they're easier to read, I think, than some of the Microsoft Docs material. I think some of the Microsoft Docs material could be a little bit dry sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, you know, this, this stuff is written in a really nice and, you know, um, engaging it's, it's written, way. Yeah, it's written in a personable exactly. way as well, as if, as if, yeah, yeah as if you're a yeah. person reading it. I, yeah, yeah, I do like I, them. So yeah, I mean, when I started, I, I mean, I've really let me. I mean, I'll show you actually. I can, um, yeah. I mean, I, I can show you actually. I, mean, I am starting blogging myself as well. Um, it's uh, it's not as easy as I as I kind of thought it would be. I mean, this is this will be on the site tomorrow, 
um, as I say, so this is the big data analytics with Azure and Power BI. So I'm taking what I'm trying to do here is really show the end to end, uh, you know, Synapse and Power BI and everything working together. And also, actually, this this topic is actually about nothing technical, right? which is where I think you actually need to start with stuff in real life. Right. And uh, not for the exam. None of this stuff is in the exam. Um, exam is obviously, obviously pure technical, but real life, I think actually it's it's you don't you can get very bogged down with all the technicalities. So what I really wanted to do was say, let's take a step back. Let's imagine we're you know looking at buying New York City taxi medallion. Um, you know, how what kind of things do we need to do? How do we need to understand what kind of data model we need? And, you know, going through on what kind of business questions do we need? this report to answer, how do we de design a data model using things like a bus matrix and, um, you know, and then there's this idea of star nets, which I appreciate is not very well known, but I think the concept is, is, is quite, is, is quite well known. So, you know, how you actually design your data model before you go and build stuff um, and design those aggregations. Um, so that was really actually, it's, it's because I covered so much in that session um, in an hour and a half video there, I've decided to put it into blog posts and, and have a few different formats for that as well. Um, so I think we've just got a couple of slides just to really finish off and um, yep, so we've done that. Yep, and really that was just to, just to recap. Again, don't try and be an expert on all of it. If you've been working with Power BI for a couple of years, you're probably good enough on the experience level of Power BI. You might just need to brush up on a couple of topics, just identify what those are and, and read up on those. And then for the stuff around Synapse and Purview and things like that, really Microsoft Docs, Nicola's, Andy's content. If you've gone through a little bit of that, you'll be fine. You won't. You don't need to be an expert on all of it. No one is an expert on all of it. Um, try and use try and use some of that practice questions and yep, yeah, as I say, kind of find those. Um, uh, the, that material that kind of resonates with you. So what I'm going to do is just put on this um, poll again. And, and actually, given that this group collectively got 100% on those quiz questions, and I have tried to make those quiz questions at least as hard as the real exam, um, I'm going to just put a quick poll. Oh, sorry, not wrong one. So we're all going to be super confident now. Yeah, well, let's see. I mean, maybe not. If you're not, you know, don't feel obliged to say that you are. <laughs> Um, but now that you've been through this session, um, you know, what's your um, what's your view on um, how you feel about the exam at the moment? Just to get a word or two just to close off the session. Better, great, ready, OK, cool, confident. Oh, this is good. Overwhelmed, yeah. I mean, to be fair, there's a lot, a lot of content. It's a very broad syllabus. It's very deep. Um, you know, this is why I kind of was really putting out those free tips to say, don't try and master everything. Don't try and consume all the content and all of this stuff on the internet. It's just, you know, it's it's too much. Just focus on, you know, use practice questions if you can. Try and identify which areas you you know a lot about, which areas you don't. There's areas that you don't, especially for some of the setups and purview stuff. Just read the Microsoft Docs, have a quick look at Nicola's and Andy's content, and that will be enough. And there's some QR codes for the session there. So that was a, a two-hour session. So sorry, we did one. Yeah, exactly. A huge thanks. I don't. It know was a workshop. Thank you guys. <laughs> it was a workshop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any... I, I really don't know how to thank you guys. Re really, this is by far the most enjoyable meetup I have ever done in the last maybe four years. Uh, that was hell of a session. Definitely. Thank you very, thanks, very thanks much. For for, uh, thanks, thanks yeah, for hosting, hosting us. Thanks for hosting us. It, 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 it was a pleasure, really. Yeah, yeah. That's it was a pleasure to no, thank, you, thank you for people staying for two hours. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks, everyone, for staying two hours with us. Yeah, much appreciated. That was amazing. And hit us up on Twitter and ask some questions. We'll be happy to point you in the direction of various other things. Yeah, um, I'll put in my uh, LinkedIn as well, just so you can, and if other people can do the same. Um, I mean, yeah, obviously attendees as well, right? Obviously, if you have linked to yours, also LinkedIn.com IN, isn't it? Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Really. Uh, okay. I, I think we, we can stop recording here. Uh, it will be available in about two weeks on our YouTube channel.